Okay, well, welcome to Jesus and Coffee, and today it's just a good old Aquafina. So, hey, uh, we got to make sure that we stay hydrated. It's getting hot outside, so, hey, we want to welcome you today to, uh, this is our Valley High Wednesday night uh, online Bible study, and uh, <clears throat> we've gone through a couple of different things, and today it's Jesus and Coffee, the Disciples Ministry, the Disciples Ministry. But, hey, we have a quick icebreaker for you today. So if this is your first time, we usually start out with a couple of icebreakers. And what this is about is we just ask you a question. So who was the best teacher you've ever had? Now, type it in uh, down here in the blog or wherever, wherever you want. Well, the best teacher I've probably ever had was Mr. Bryson. He was a high school uh, choir director. Um, no excuses, right? And then uh, my, it's probably two. And then uh, Professor McKinley, which was one of my uh, choir directors in, 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 in college, and uh, another no excuses type of person, so um, they really molded me into sort of the the teacher I am today. I would think, oh, you know, but um, <clears throat> you know, we're talking about uh, the uh, the disciples ministry. Now, this is Jesus in Coffee, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I want to start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll get to reading. So let's pray. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to come to know you, to be with you, to be discipled by your Holy Spirit. Father, thank you for placing those uh, that are entrusted to us to teach us, to disciple us, Father. May that I, being as a shepherd of, of a church, may I disciple uh, in your name the gospel, the good news. In, most, uh, in, in, the, in the name above all names, Jesus Christ, amen. I always get tongue-tied at the very end, but I want to read a couple of Bible verses to you today. And uh, we're going to be taking a look at, uh, we're going to be looking at Paul and Timothy. So I'm going to tell you right off the bat, you need to be a Paul to someone, and you need to someone to be a Timothy to you. Now here's the deal. I'm very big into, it needs to be a male Paul to a male Timothy, and then a female Paul to a female Timothy, if that makes any sense to you. But uh, if you're out there and you're a female and you think you're discipling another man, uh, it just doesn't work that way. Here's the deal. Find someone. Find someone that you can learn from, that someone that can help you move and be disciple you. Someone that's an elder, someone, you know. I've even had, I, at one time, there was a person that would, that was, would pray with me and the guy was younger than I was. And, and that's okay. Well, here's the deal. Maybe they've been in Christianity longer than you have. But here's the deal. You need to be a Paul and a Timothy. And you'll see why a little bit later. But let's go ahead and get started with our Bible verses today. Again, I'm multitasking, so you're going to see me looking around. I have this whole organ. No, it's just a bunch of little stuff that we use for blogging. But uh, this is actually Acts 16, 1 through 4. This is NIV. And it says, Paul came to Derby, and then to Lystra, uh, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was Greek. The believers at Lystra and uh, Iconium uh, spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that, this, that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. You know, Timothy, my son, I am giving... Oh, sorry. I just want to go to the next verses. So this is actually Timothy 1, 18 through 19. Now, now here's the deal. I'm going to be reading a lot of verses, so keep up. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with your prophets, in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well. Nineteen says, holding on to the faith and the good conscience, which some have rejected, and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. Next is First Timothy four eleven through sixteen. Command and teach things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to the preaching and teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hand on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Pre, uh, persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and hearers. Now this is Second Timothy 2, 1 through 3. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. Join with me in the suffering like a good soldier of Christ. Well, welcome to Jesus and Coffee. This is the Disciples Ministry. So, like I said earlier, if you're not being discipled and you're not in your Bible, 
don't expect to grow when you see other people moving on. You know, I had a friend when I was younger and um, <clears throat> he was a golfer, right? And all of a sudden, uh, others, he, I mean, he was a very gifted golfer when he was really, really young. And then all of a sudden, as he's growing, he's noticing other people getting just as good as he was. So it was no longer easy for him just to go through. But what happened was he stopped practicing. He stopped practicing and others started practicing, you know what, to move up. And here's the deal. Sometimes in Christianity, you see other people moving up spiritually. They're, 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 they're breaking strongholds, um, uh, miracles manifesting in their life. People are coming to be saved around them and you're there like, like what? Well, here's the thing. Are you a Timothy to a Paul? Are you seeking out someone to help you? You know what? If you, if you, if you need a Paul, I'll be, I'll be your Paul. If you need someone to disciple you, here's the thing. If you, I, I'm going to volunteer my wife, Adriana. If you're a female and you need someone to talk to, she's out there to talk to. So uh, wherever we're, we're here to, to, but also understand that we're not above having, and, and Adriana and I have our, our, our Pauls and we're Timothys to those. So let's start off by asking, basically making this statement, enlisting others to disciple. You know, my job is to preach and teach and to come and to lead the congregation. And one of the big things is there is to to build up the leadership and, and, and it's enlisting others to disciple. Well, let's start off with who was Paul's mentor. And for that, we're going to go to Acts 11, 25 through 26. It says, then Barnabas went to Taurus to look for Saul. Okay, so Saul is Paul's old name, if you don't know. And when he found him, he bought, he, he brought him to Antioch. And, and so, so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught the great number of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Do you notice that? Where did they start calling people Christians? In Antioch. There's a good... So, just in case you didn't know. Well, you know, well, let's go back. Okay, so who was, so who was Paul's mentor? You want to say it out loud with me? Barnabas was Paul's mentor, you know? So people just think Paul went out and just started discipling people. No, he waited for a year to to be to be uh, ready to go out, you know? And it was, it was something, you know? When I decided I wanted to be a pastor, I was like, you know what? Uh, I don't think I'm ready. I had to be my own worst critic. And I had to say, I said, you know what? If I'm going to be a pastor... I feel like I want to do it right now. And a lot of people, I want to jump into it. I want to do, man, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go now, Pastor. I said, I understand you're ready to go now. But don't you think that God might be calling you to prepare you now for later? Some people want to jump into things. And yes, the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will give you things to do, things to say, ways to act. But it does help to have a little bit of formal teaching in there. You know, uh, that's why I decided to go to seminary. That's why we started small groups, but instead of me just saying, hey, why don't y'all go teach people out there how to do it, we had training for small groups. Wednesday nights, we would meet in person. And if you want to start a small group, get with me. We'll, we'll train you how to do that. Well, our next question is, the brothers, in verse 2, spoke well of Timothy. Discuss what traits they may have seen in Timothy that made him a good candidate to train in preparation to disciple others. What influence impacted Timothy's early years? Now, what traits, right, <clears throat> are are uh, that made him a good candidate to train others to disciple others? There's some people out there like, man, I want, but you, you have to have these traits. Well, you know, um, in uh, in in Timothy, first Second Timothy one five, it says, "I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Louis and your mother Ernest, uh, and I am persuaded." now lives in you also now they knew he came from good a good upbringing how many of y'all have known people in the past that said man uh yeah i know their parents they brought them up good and that's the thing they knew that his grandmother and his mother were believers now um you know and they had good rapport but then they also saw this in timothy and they saw those same traits you know delivered to timothy you know next we have what problems was timothy up against in the church of Ephesus. Now, if I read 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 5, it says, As I urge you, when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not in, in, to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, such as such things promote controversial speculation rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Well, 
one thing that he was facing was people were out there teaching false doctrine. Now, let me tell you, as about, I deal with this a lot. There's people over there. Uh, oh, they, they, they have the evil eye. They say, oh, get the will, get the right. Or they, you know, someone <clears throat> has, has done this. And there's a lot of false doctrine in the church. I, and it's not, it's in every church. I will tell you, I run into it a lot. And then people, well, I didn't know that. Well, get in your Bible. Come on. And here's the deal. I deal with it a lot. And so do the teachers of our church. There's some people who have ideas about ministry, and I'm like, that's not the way ministry works. Have ideas about, you know, uh, doctrine, and I'm like, well, have you read your Bible? Have you read our, our Baptist faith and message? Uh, they, or they have a, a theology. I'm like, wow, that is not even close to what the Bible says, you know, especially when the, the Jehovah Witnesses come and knock at my door, you know. But, you know, another thing that they were having was following myths, myths. <clears throat> so like I said, like, oh, oh man, they got the evil eye or, or don't, or don't sweep the feet because, because you're going to get, you're not going to get married if you get your feet swept, you know, things like that, you know, but I mean, back then they, they, it was just a whole lot that they were dealing with. And then genealogies, man, you still see this in the church today. Well, do you know whose son they are or do you know who's, and this is different than, than when they were comparing it, Timothy to his mother and grandmother, they were saying, look, good rapport. What these other people were doing is they were saying, do you know I come from a Lord or do you know that I come from this family so I should be in charge? And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that, that way this year either. Well, the next thing is to, uh, we got to read uh, that we should encourage and instruct. We should encourage and instruct. Now, I'll tell you, too, man, I'll be like, man, I hope this Bible study stretches you. I hope, but I hope it stretches you. I hope it, and I say, I hope it upsets you. You know why? Because usually you get upset about something that's being preached or taught. And if you open your eyes, ears, and your heart, later on you're going to see that God was saying it for the benefit of you. You know, like, man, I don't know why they're, why they, the pastor preaches about that, or uh, we had a special guest, he talked about this, or we have this, and I don't know why they keep talking about that, and it bothers you and it bothers you. But here's the deal. If everybody else agrees that it's this way, and you're the only person that doesn't agree that's that way, it's probably because you're wrong, and especially within within the Bible. You know how many people have gone up against that teaching false doctrine, and, um, they teaching false doctrine is you can use your salvation. I'm all saliva. You can lose your salvation. I'm like, no, you can't. You can't lose your salvation. This isn't the Bible. God's never not going to take away anything that He's given to you. Now here's the deal. But we got to be encouraging. The reason I'm so hardcore as a pastor, the reason I'm so excited about discipling people, is because I know what can come out of it. I know. A lot of people say that what, what will pull you out of uh, poverty? Education. Well, you know what? Education in Jesus Christ will pull anybody out of poverty. You know why? Because He sets you up. Because when you do things 100% here, you do it 100% for God, in His name, things are going to happen. So encourage and instruct people. Encourage and instruct people. So what are some ministry essentials and their significance in discipling others? And what are ways you can encourage others? Now, I want to read this. Uh, this is 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16. And it says, Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for believers. Now, real quick, a lot of young people use this. Don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. But then they forget about this next part, comma. But set an example for believers in speech and conduct and in love and faith and in purity. There's a lot of young people out there and a lot of old people out there that aren't doing this. And, and the thing is, is that they want to be an example, but they're not following what they're supposed to be doing. So young people, oh, you're saying this just because I'm young. I'm not saying that because you're young. I'm saying it because you're not conducting yourself um, in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity. Well, okay. Number thir uh, uh, verse 13 says, Until I come, devote yourselves to public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. Do not neglect, neglect your gift, which was given to you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Now, what are some ways... Are some ministry essentials and their significance in discipling others? And what are ways that we can encourage other people? Well, first is set an example for other believers in speech. If you're out there, <laughs> if you're out there and your speech is like ridiculous, and this goes with everything. If you're just talking, oh, like if you're a Debbie Downer about everything, man, believe me, people aren't going to like that. In conduct, if you can't behave, really, love, love people. Love people. Like, I know it's hard sometimes, you know. Uh, you love them. Doesn't mean you got to like them. But God says to love them. And uh, faith. If you're not exercising your faith, what makes you think that others want to listen? Others want to listen to you about, you talk about your faith. Anyway, purity. If you're not being pure, 
you know. Well, next it says you can devote yourself to public reading of the scriptures. There's some people out there that say, well, I read my Bible. Well, you know what? It says to read it out loud, to talk to people about scriptures, to go and, and share the scriptures with others. God bless you. You know why? Because God loves you. Because God, for God to love the world, that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Read those out loud. And then we can uh, preach and teach. I love to preach. I love to teach. But here's the deal. Well, that's for you, Pastor. No, it's not. It's not just for me. It's for everybody. If you're if if you've been a Christian all your life, and you're still a, you're and, and 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 you're sitting in Sunday school, and you how do you say? How would I say this? Thinking about this. Okay, so if you're sitting in Sunday school, you've been a Christian for more than a year, and you're not, you're not even teaching Sunday school. There's something wrong with you. Because you become a consumer Christian, that you're just like, rah, 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 I, I just, no, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. But then it says, devote yourself to public reading scripture, preaching and teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given to you through the prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands. Some of us just sit back there and want people, you, or you want me to preach it. You want me to preach it. Oh, I love that. I love that sermon. And then, and then, but there's never any action put into it. A lot of these words that we read in the Greek Koine language, they're taught, they're, they're spoken in a way of that it's an action. It's not just to sit there and take this note, it's to take and to get into action to actually do this. So the next thing is because do not neglect your gift. How can you serve? Do not neglect your gift. There's a lot of people just sitting around in the church that are neglecting their gifts because they've been convinced that their job is just to sit there. And this is not just at Valley High, it's everywhere. Why? Because if everybody was moving and shaking and reading scripture, if they were preaching and teaching, and if they were, let me go back a little bit, uh, if they were uh, in speech and conduct, in love and faith and purity, if everybody was doing that, could you imagine the revival that would be breaking out? Yeah. Yeah. And then we're to encourage others by completely living out our faith. A lot of us, our faith stops at the church doors. Okay, let me put my tie on. Oh, I'm out of service. Let me pull my tie off, right? I never wear ties anymore. I have to, used to have to wear them every day. But we have to live out our faith. Why, are, why would anybody want our faith if we can't even live it out? What good is our faith if, if we leave it in church and it never goes out into the world? Well, next question goes along with this. Yeah. Why was Paul so concerned that Tim, uh, that Timothy become a successful discipler? Okay, why was he so? Our verse tells us so that he may remain in ministry. If you're teaching and you're preaching and you're exercising, you're living out in love, you will stay in the ministry because there's more things trying to convince you to fall away from God than to try to convince you to go to God. You know why? Because we go to God. You know, he's there, he's waiting for us, but it's our purpose to get closer to him. Why? Because he's ready for us. There's no doubt about that, but he wants us to move closer. But if you would know the numbers, I've ran out of hand. Let me make sure my hands are on screen. My hands on screen? There we go. So, of people that I know that have been in ministry and have fallen away. You know, for a short time, I got real nervous that I was going to fall away from ministry. And I said, no, 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 no. I need to get back into it. I need to make sure that I'm going to be a successful discipler, that that what I preach and teach, that I'm willing to live by what I preach and teach. And then ultimately, he needed to become a successful discipler because others needed to be saved. Others needed to be saved. Folks, if you think it's my job at the church that I'm the only one that's supposed to preach the gospel and to disciple, that's wrong. <laughs> the same Holy Spirit that resides in me resides in you if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. And the thing is, is that you are suppressing it and not allowing the Holy Spirit himself to be able to move out and to do amazing things in you. Well, why is having someone believe in you and depend on you for a positive force in overcoming opposition, maintaining right behavior, and rising to a higher level a spiritual impact well first of all you can't preach a gospel that you don't have you can't preach a gospel that you don't exercise you you, you can't be 
you can uh, all I all I say is hypocrites cannot be leaders. Now let me tell you, I can tell you, man, you need to be healthy. You need to run. You need to go. But you know what happens if I go out there and try to run five miles right now? Yeah, um, you're gonna see my lunch. You know, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, you can't preach what you're not doing. You can't preach what you don't have. You know, you're. It's like. <laughs> It was at School of Rock, those who can't teach, no wait, those who don't do teach or something like that. He comes up with this line. Basically, the idea of it is, like, if you can't do it, you know, you, you can teach it. Well, here's the deal. That's completely wrong. You know, I think of baseball. I love baseball. So some of the best baseball coaches are people who are out there and have lived and breathed and done it. Like, I don't know. I listen to Troy Aikman when he calls football games, and he is, like, spot on. Like, you know, he's out there. I'm like, man, this guy should be a coach, but he probably won't be a coach because he probably makes more as a commentator or a broadcaster, or whatever you want to call him. But those you see, those who have played the game, those who have lived the life are able to teach it so much on a deeper level. And this is the thing that why is having someone believe in you and depend on you for a positive force of overcoming opposition, maintaining right behavior and rising to a higher level of spiritual impact? Because they know that if someone has come that has been there, it means much more than them. someone that is just out there saying, well, this is what you do. This is, why do you think when I preach to you, I say, hey, guess what? I've done this. And guess what? Because that same Holy Spirit that resides in me, resides in you, and you can do it too. Yeah, I have a lot of crazy stories. and But you know what? It's because God gave me an opportunity to get out there and to live in Him. Crazy, awesome stories. Some of them scary, some of them great, but guess what? You get to live that too. And I hope this encourages you to say, you know what, man, I can get out there and I can do it too. It's not just for positive reinforcement. No, it's for spiritual uplifting so that you may know that if you feel warm, you feel on fire, that you're, you have the spirit in you that's burning. And guess what? It's burning in you, but you got to go out there and get more logs. You got to get more people. And guess what? When you get a lot of people together, it makes a spiritual bonfire that can be seen everywhere. Our scriptures talk about it being a lighthouse. Folks, you see lighthouses from far, far away. The only problem is, is when we don't kindle that, when we don't get together, when we don't disciple each other, that fire gets real, real, real small when it doesn't it's not supposed to. But if you want to disciple others, you have to be that encourager. Now, I know it's hard sometimes. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes a, a pessimist, and I look at things, and I'm like, man, dear God. But then that just shows God's glory when it comes through. Well, Next, we got to entrust to others. Now, I'll tell you real quick. I'm that type of person that I'm like, man, I just rather, I just rather do it myself because I'll get it done faster in everything. Believe me, if I'm working. That's just me because I'm like, man, I know I've pre-thought out the process and I know exactly where I'm going with it. But I kind of like, I'm like, man, I'll just get it done faster. But here's the thing: if you don't disciple other people, if you don't entrust things to them, you're never going to grow. You're never, you're never going to grow past yourself. And I remember FBC Del Rio during the summer, I remember the pastor said, I'm going to give you a rubber band, Santiago. He would say Santiago. I said, why? He goes, because every time you need to, you need to snap it to remind you to be flexible to start entrusting others to ministry. Because I was going crazy, man. I was, I was trying to do everything myself. Well, I want to read a verse to you. This is 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. It says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. Paul's telling him, the things you have heard me say, don't go out there making up your own doctrine. Don't go up there making up your own thing that, oh, this is the way you do church, or this is the way he's saying, no, do it the way that I taught you how to do it. The problem is, is that, Try to teach you how to do stuff, and then you try to change it. That's what he's saying. Well, and then in verse 3, it says, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. It's not going to be easy. I'm telling you, it's not going to be easy at all. Well, let's discuss the hardships and joys associated with being a discipler. Now, here's the deal. I'm just old enough that <clears throat> a lot of my youth, like two generations, almost three generations of teenagers, already have families. Now, I've seen people go towards the bad end, and I've seen people go towards the good end. But what are the hardships? Some of the hardships are having people who want to be discipled. I'm going to tell you. Look on the view. Go after this. 
click back a day later, see how many people actually watch this discipleship. Mm, right? Now, question. If I stop doing this, there'd be more people upset about me not doing a Wednesday night study because it canceled than actually views on Facebook and YouTube. Hmm. Mm, think about that. Now, not just in church, but out of church, right? Now, here's the deal. A hardship is having people who want to be discipled. Part of being discipled is being molded into something that is not you. So one big turnoff from being discipled is people just don't want to change. Being discipled is so you can become more like Christ, so that he may mold you like clay, so that he may chip away those those, those those rigid pieces of yourself so that you can become more like Him. And people don't like to hear that they're wrong. So that's a hardship right there. Having people open their hearts to being disciple instead of looking for something to prove the disciple are wrong. I guarantee you there's a lot, a lot of you out there that are like, oh, pastor said that. I'm gonna, oh, no, I don't believe that. And then you read the Bible, you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that is, that is true. Wow, I can't believe this. Because believe me, I do a lot of research. I love research. Like, it's crazy. So a lot, of, a lot of us go into a sermon and, and we're there and we're trying to prove that person wrong. I blame Google. Everybody thinks they're an expert. But here's the deal. Don't go in trying to prove the speaker wrong. Go in and try to see what God will be able to speak to them. Like this last, this last time, and I could have sat, this last Sunday, I could have sat there and, and, and Pastor Dan Pierce was preaching and I could have said, I could have went in there. And I'll tell you what. It's hard to listen to a sermon without looking at the critical things that they do in the way that they format there. And I just to listen to a sermon so that I may grow through that. And uh, I, I did. I sat back. I took notes. And I said, wow. Now, I could have went back and said, you know what? Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. But you know what? There were some things that he said that I was like, mm, man, that, that, that gets me. But I didn't say, man, I hate him for that. I can't believe he would say that. No. No, you know what he was doing? He was allowing the Holy Spirit to speak truth so that everybody in that room and online could grow. So, no, I did not go trying to prove that pastor wrong. I went to so that pastor can help me grow, right? Another one is having someone you disciple fall away from ministry. I'll talk about this in a couple of other studies that I got coming up, but yeah, we hear a lot about Timothy, but we don't hear about the other person who Paul says will pray for me because this person just left me and left the ministry. I've had people who have said, I'm going to partner with you in ministry, and then they're the first ones to leave. High and dry. Yeah. Are you working with someone in church or doing all this other stuff? And then all of a sudden, they're not around anymore. They show up maybe once, twice. I want to do this, and then they're gone. No. What about putting all that time into people who just don't want it? It's a hardship about being a discipler. You put in all this time and effort to prepare, you pray, you do all this stuff, and then... Sometimes people just don't want it. It's a difficult thing. And it, the, the, I guess the hardest thing would be is that seeing that they're more willing to take the word of the world than the word of God. That's a hard thing. But let me show you something. You remember that? These are the good stuff. So I want you to notice part of what's hard about being a discipler when you just change the words around, it becomes good. Watch. Having people who want to be discipled as opposed to having people who don't want to be discipled. Right? Secondly, having people open their hearts to being discipled and wanting to learn as opposed to having people with their hearts looking to prove the disciple are wrong. Having people who are disciplined to turn into disciples as opposed to having someone you disciple fall away from ministry. And then putting all that time in preparation because... People yearn to be discipled as opposed to putting all that time in and people just don't want it. You notice that it, how like the negatives, when you just flip them around, they become the positives. It's weird. Like people who don't want it. And then the, the pluses that just keeps you going is those that you see that, that the sparkle in their eye that, man, they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And man, I'm so much closer to God because of it. That's what keeps you going. Well, Spiritual growth often leads us to stepping out of our comfort zone. Now, I want you to share with those around you 
about a time that that happened to you. Now, how did God stretch you? Now, I keep using this Lionel Richie line because, man, it's so big. And he's sitting in American Idol. And you may not like his songs, but guess what, man? This guy has lived. So, yeah. Uh, so here's the deal. He said that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So I took that and I said, you know what? Your Christian life begins at the end of your comfort zone. So, spiritual growth also often leads to stepping out of our comfort zone. Share about a time this has happened to you and how did God stretch you. Well, let me get ready for this because I want to say this right. So here's the deal. I, I, I lived in the valley. Like The thing was is I, I remember I would drive there pretty much every weekend uh, for about two years. Uh, one and a half year, two, two years. And my thing was I was a missionary from Trinity Baptist Church. And I was going down there. And the thing was is I'm like, man, everybody speaks Spanish in the valley. I didn't speak Spanish at all, right? But it was just cool because I was working with teenagers. I was doing education initiatives, getting ready for VBS during the summer and stuff like that. And then uh, all of a sudden, all the kids took off. And those were the kids who, those were the ones who spoke English. Well, I didn't realize that it was mostly migrant worker families. So when the season came, they, they took off. And there was no one there. So then Rick McClatchy from one of our professors says, hey, uh, he just comes in and knocks on my door out of the blue. Didn't know he was going to show up. And he goes, hey, um, uh, we got another uh, internship for you. If you'd like it, I said, yeah, I go, anything is better than just sitting here all day. There's no one here, like literally no one around. He goes, well, you're going to go uh, intern over here at, at uh, Buckner Child and Family Services, and you're going to be working in the river ministry. I said, oh, cool, awesome. What's going on? You do? He goes, you're going to take missionaries across the border. I was like, oh, cool. Oh, that's awesome. I know the border really well. He's like, okay. He goes, well, I'll see you later. I said, wait, 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 wait. I go, what missionaries? And he goes, American missionaries. I go, do they speak Spanish? And he goes, no. I go, well, who's going to translate for him? I and he goes, you are. And I was like, but I don't speak Spanish. He goes, you will. And then just slams the door and leaves. I'm like, what in the world? You know what? Every single person I took across the border, I never was a, without a time that I didn't know a Spanish word that I needed to know to be able to translate. And you know what? And God stretched me. And the thing is, God wants to stretch you too. He wants to stretch you to be prepared for the battle that's ahead. Folks, I don't know if you know this, but we're living in a time where, like I said earlier, most people would rather take what the world is going to say rather than what Christ is going to say, or His Father, or His Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. You need to be discipled. It's like, I can't go out and run a marathon next week. I haven't been exercising the way I'm supposed to. But guess what? If I was, I'd be ready. Some of you aren't ready because you're not in your Bible. Some of you are not ready because you, you, only, you're, you want to be discipled on your own terms. And that's not the way it works. I don't know. If I would have went to third grade and had the third grade teacher teach me what I wanted to learn in third grade, then I would have never have moved forward. And that's the way some of us go at church. You want to hear what you want to hear, and you don't want to hear what God wants you to hear. And you choose just not to participate or not to be, or you're just too busy for things. But here's the deal. When the day of reckoning comes, are you going to be ready? Will God say, depart from me because I never knew you? Well, I knew you. Really? Did you really know me? Because you only know, you, you only know the, the, the summer camp version of me. You only know the, the Christmas version of me. You might only know the, 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 uh, uh, the, the Easter version of me. But you don't really know me, and I don't really know you. Now, here's my thing. <clears throat> In closing, is there something God would have you do to cooperate more fully with his plan of discipleship? Is there something God would have you do to cooperate more fully with his discipleship? Just like that third grade analogy I, I gave you. Some of y'all might be saying, "Why well, I want this. Oh, I, I wish there was a Bible study in this. Why don't you go to the Bible study that they're already having? How do you know that God won't work on that through himself, through his word, to be able to teach you what you need to learn to be able to get over that other stuff? Well, I need a church that, that does this. Well, guess what? It's out there. I'm sure it is. But as long as the message is being preached, we are to listen. I remember... A professor got up in, in chapel one day and said, God gave you two ears and one mouth. If he gave you two ears and one mouth, what you because by percentage, what you which one should you be using uh, more? Well, our ears. He goes, Then why am I hearing you know, talk so much? I was like, Oh, professor. Here's the deal. If you're not if you don't have a Paul, you need to get one. 
And if you don't have a Timothy, you need to get one. And this is, I remember when I first started teaching guitar lessons, I really didn't know that much about guitar. But I was always one lesson ahead of the students, sometimes two lessons, because I had sometimes I had some quick-witted students. Here's the deal. Those of you who are, who are saved on Sunday are a day ahead of those who were saved on Monday. So guess what? That's a whole day ahead that you can be teaching them what happened the day before. Secondly, are you really going to let that person saved on Monday become your discipler because you decided to stay on Sunday? Does that make sense? I hope it does. You know, uh, I hope I hope this encourages you. I know sometimes, sometimes it sounds like, man, pastor's just he's giving us a regaña. I'm not I'm not giving you a regaña. What I am telling you is you're missing out. You're missing out on the glorious life that God has given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. On oh, man, cast your anxiety on Him because He cares. And you're like, oh, I've done that, but it doesn't work. No, but if you really knew how to do it, like the Bible says, then it would work. Most of the times we can't do things because we won't read the instruction manual. You know, I I, I I say this all the time. I'm like, man, give me an instruction manual so I can know how it works. Now, here's the deal. You want to know how it works? Get the Bible. Get the instruction manual. And guess what? It comes with 24-7 operating. Uh, what do they call that? Uh, call and help? General help? I can't remember the word. Type it in if you remember what the word is. 24-7 uh, operation assistant, something like that. Yeah, that's what we got. We got, we got the ultimate way to know God and to get closer to Him. Let's pray. Blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you because you are great and you are kind, you are gracious, your majesty, you are the authority, you are justice. You have sent your Son to die for us, Father. And because of that, um, we are saved. We can come back to you because the chasm has been filled. Father, your Holy Spirit resides in us now, Father, and teaches us. Father, but you've placed many around us that would be able to help us move through this Christian life through instruction, through testimony, through, through to talking about the things that they've been through. Father, allow those to find out and seek someone to disciple them, Father. And then let us not just be a consumer Christian, Father. Let us be one who goes and, 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 and does, one that would share that knowledge with others as they are coming up below and rising to, to the top with your name. Father, we do this in your most holy name I pray. Amen. Hey, well, that's all we have for this week. So we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.